Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we'll take a trip back in time. We'll check out the Rapid River Relic Riders Vintage Snowmobile Run. Then a look at a brand new club, the Balkan Relic Riders. And we'll talk UP Wildlife with DNR Wildlife Division Chief Russ Mason. That's all tonight, so sit back, put your feet up. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Those of us who were part of it, the era of snowmobiling on machines that are now considered vintage or relics was a special time in snowmobiling history. The variety of machines seem endless. Snow jet, ski rule, John Deere, chaparral, the list goes on. Oil injection was pouring oil into the gas jug along with the gas. You never left the garage without a spark plug wrench and a pocket full of extra plugs and a tow rope. You could change a carburetor along the trail and there was a good chance you had an extra one in the trunk. The smell of mixed gas two-stroke exhaust never left your snowmobile suit. And it was a good smell for some reason. As a friend of mine calls it, OD two-stroke. A ride was a crapshoot. You could arrive back home on one ski, or one cylinder, or at the end of a rope. About the only thing predictable about a ride is that it would be fun. I traveled the Rapid River where hundreds of these vintage machine enthusiasts gather each year for the annual Rapid River Relics Ride. This is our 10th annual ride that we're having today. Um, tomorrow will be our 11th annual show. The first year we didn't have the ride. Um, last year we, we had over 300 sleds, and I don't know what, we're, what we have today, but we have quite a few. It's wonderful to get all these people together uh, with the old sleds, and we try to make it more of a family thing. You'll see a lot of kids on the ride and stuff. I, I think really what it is is a lot of us are trying to relive our childhood. You know, it brings back memories uh, from the sleds we used to have, and it's just a lot of fun. We're here in Rapid River in the UP, and I'm here strictly because of the ride today in Rapid River. And you're gonna see a lot of different sleds here today. This is gonna be a large ride. Uh, I've been to a lot of shows and rides across the, the snow belt, and uh, I've never attended this one, but I've heard nothing but good things for a lot of years. You're gonna see things from Snowjet, Snow Prince, Scorpion, Boweski, Arty Cat, Polaris. The ride, I say, is about 20 miles, they say it is. Some people are a little concerned with the snow conditions. Not an issue today. We'll be able to make this ride. The nice thing about the older snow machines, they didn't require as much snow to be able to go. So you get a couple, three inches, you can make things happen. Well, we started this club 11 years ago, the Rapid River Relic Riders. And um, we've been doing it, like I say, every year, and it gets bigger and bigger every year. I'm one of the guys, one of the founding members, myself and David Shope and Scott Newencamp. We started this about 11 years ago, uh, picking up where the Rock Ridge Riders left off. They had a last show and we decided that we should just keep something like this going because it's a great time. We got people coming from all over the place. Uh, last year I know that we had people from Ohio. We get a lot of people from downstate, Wisconsin area. Uh, you know, it's a trade-off thing. We do a lot of these shows too, a lot of us members do. So, you know, when you support their show, they come and support you too. And it's all, most of them are all community driven. There are so many different type sleds out there. And, and what I love about it is the, the smelling the different fuel mixtures, you know, that everybody uses. Um, it's, it's just a lot of fun, you know, everybody, it's, a, it's like a family, you know. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, we're going to go up to trailhead number two, head across to the ski hill and come down and head over to the Kipling. Um, it's probably around 22 miles, 24 miles round trip. I had a ski whiz growing up, that's that's how I got into it, you know, and, and you know, I own like maybe 140 some of them. We just picked another one up and it's probably the nicest one I got. I always tell my wife that, you know. <laughs> Everybody's got a reason why they're riding those. Just, they grew up on one or their dad had them when they were a kid or something like that, you know, and it's, it's just something, it's a bug that you can't get rid of. You know, some people never grow up and I'm one of them guys. I've been involved with vintage sleds for over 20 years. In the UP culture, it's very welcoming. You, you, I go to a lot of shows across the country, and when you come to the UP, they make you feel like you're part of the community. From the minute you show up to the minute that you leave, you are part of the community. And I don't get that everywhere we go, so it's very nice. And that's why I spend a lot of time in the UP in the winter. It's almost like deer season when everybody's up here for deer season. This, this has become a big attraction. But I just love doing it. I love the, I've met the greatest people doing it. Um, we're like family, you know? And uh, having more people come here that's never been to our community before, I just love that. I love to, you know, show off our town and, and our ride. It's a great ride. Um, I mean, the snow conditions could be better, but we're going to make the best of it. you got to love the UP. There's no doubt about that. Another vintage ride took place the same weekend in the Faithorn Vulcan area. The ride was put on by a brand new club, the Vulcan Relic Riders. We're getting together for our first ride that we've ever had with the Vulcan Relic Riders. Uh, we had hoped to have like 15. Looks to be that we're going to be close to 30 sleds today. So uh, we're getting pretty good turnout. We're excited about things to come. We used to run down the Lena quite a bit. Uh, uh, probably eight, nine years ago, we used to run a vintage run down there. And I just got kind of tired of going down that area. So a bunch of friends down here in Faithorn, we started uh, picking them up again. and. It started growing, so we decided we'd uh, start a club, try and get one going on this end of the upper Michigan. And uh, today is our first ride that we actually have scheduled. We had a very good turnout. We got almost a little over 30 sleds here, I believe, today. I didn't get a rough count on them. Hoping to actually get more sanctioned rides, you know, get a lot more family orientated, you know, get people out and enjoying themselves nowadays. We'd like to uh, get a show going, we'd like to get something like Rapid Rivers got going for this end of the UP. Um, you know, just to get together and have fun and have a good time. We're going to take off from here today and we're going to run up to uh, Three Lakes Bar and uh, by the Hamilton Lakes area and come back and uh, Long Branch is putting on a dinner for us so everybody will be back later on today. Um, have a little lunch and I'm sure people will be down to look at the sleds and reminisce and have a good time. Uh, round trip it's about 25 miles we figured we'd keep this one small everybody can get their sleds tuned in and stuff and before we go on the next one which is going to be the 11th of uh, February. Well, we got a pretty good mixture it looks like the Arctic cats are winning today that seems to be the most of them. We got the chaparrales and we got Plarises and Articat, of course, and uh, we got an old fox track. Guy felt is you need two things to be in the club, uh, an older snowmobile and real thick skin. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of heckling going on and who's got the better snowmobile and who's gonna break down. So uh, that part I really enjoy too is the company.
My father has passed them down to me. His grandfather, you know, fathers have passed the sleds down. We have a, today, I have a 1973 Cat Panther that's been passed down from an uncle down that passed away. My father has taken it over. He passed it down to me to take care of it and just to enjoy the memories that everybody had on it. It's just a fun thing to do and enjoy. That's what I love about the getting together, and friends and family, and it's just a good old time. On January 30th, the Department of Natural Resources met at NMU for one of two scheduled all-hands meetings here in the UP. I had the chance to sit down with Wildlife Division Chief Russ Mason and talk about some of the current issues regarding wildlife here in the Upper Peninsula. First, of course, something that's very topical. We've been talking a lot about wildlife disease in Michigan the last little while. You know, if you look at the Wildlife Division budget and you think about the sort of the obligatory part, we got to spend the salaries, the trucks and so forth, that's about 60%. And of that remaining 40%, that's everything else. That's sort of the discretionary money. About 25% of that is now going toward wildlife disease. And it's not just CWD. There's bovine tuberculosis, avian influenza, uh, and a host of other things, plus whatever is coming down the pike. All of these things are important, not just for the health of wildlife, but also because they're economically important to agriculture and, frankly, because they can kill people, some of them. Now, CWD is a particular problem for us because we've now, as you know, had uh, three different outbreaks in the state. We're thinking what we can do to manage this disease, and by manage, I mean to slow it down in all of these places. It's a kind of a thing that you can live with if you manage appropriately. There's no getting rid of it once it's established, but you can manage so that the risk of deer being infected and having it impact deer populations, or more importantly, hunting, uh, are minimized. So we're looking at that. Now concurrently, we've got the worst TD, TB problem in this state that we've had in um, 20 years. TB clearly is increasing in the northern lower peninsula. Uh, we're having herds, livestock herds show positive in places that they haven't in 15 years. We've seen deer positive in places that we haven't seen in a decade. Something needs to happen there. And so we have that to, to worry about. And what that means is that First off, we need to redouble our efforts for education. People bringing in hot carcasses from across state lines. Getting the information to people, what the diseases are, how they spread, what the risk is, and so forth. But it's more than that. What can we do to manage deer more effectively? Manage deer, not manage people, but manage deer more effectively so that we are not transmitting disease. We're having those discussions now. There's a UP Habitat Advisory Group that's providing input as we think about what we'll do here in the UP and we're engaging various strategies down south. The overall picture though is that uh, we're going to have to have conversations where people seriously consider whether inconveniences to hunting right now are acceptable for the long-term future of the resource. Here's an opportunity, one of those rare opportunities people like to talk about, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm a steward of the resource and I'm doing these things for my kids and my grandkids and the heritage, blah, blah, blah. Okay, step up to the bar, folks, it's time. We're gonna have to have those discussions because we're gonna have to adopt measures in various places that do impact hunting opportunity if we're gonna be serious about it. Um, now, I bring this up because it's important I can't do this. The Department of Natural Resources can't do this. We depend on hunters to work with us on things. If hunters don't want to cooperate, it isn't going to happen. So it's a real question of whether the public essentially wants to behave in ways that are consistent with the message that we all provide to those that don't hunt, that hunters are the, the true stewards of the resource. Something else that I, I figure is pretty big up here is the wolf litigation. We still haven't heard from the judge in Washington about whether state authorities will be returned just to remind everybody and uh, for whatever reason the guys out there still don't know state of michigan has got no jurisdictional authority over wolves period at this point they're an endangered species at the federal level something has to change for the state in order uh, for the state to get back its authorities we have a, a court case and the new administration may very well look at the endangered species act and perhaps we'll get some relief there we're looking very anxiously to get our authorities back so that we can manage wolves 
in concert with everything else. Wolves are a cool animal. I don't think anybody would disagree with me there, but at the same time, they're not cooler than deer. They're not cooler than moose. They're not cooler than a host of other species. And we can effectively manage uh, that species as we do all the rest. We have a wolf management plan. It's a competent plan. The feds endorsed it. We're going to follow that plan. We get them back. And we will get our authorities back uh, sometime. I'm just not sure when. Hopefully, it'll be much sooner than later. Uh, the third thing I wanted to talk a little bit about, because I think it's important, sometimes it gets lost in the phrase, we had a, a license increase a couple of years ago. And um, folks always want to know, well, not so much what it means for the state, but what it means for where they live. For UPERS, what that means is about a 125% increase in funding for this part of the state. 125% more money crosses the bridge to do things in the UP right now than before that license increase. That's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to find additional sources of funding. You know, the DNR, point, I think it's 0.04% of the DNR's budget overall comes from the state general fund. Uh, it's a little bit bigger when you look at various divisions or smaller. Uh, but the lion's share of how we manage all of our wildlife resources comes from hundreds of dollars matched to the Pittman-Robertson Fund. And that's good, that's great, but we could do better if everybody that enjoyed those wildlife resources was contributing. And we got to come up with a plan B. It's important to us and uh, we're going to be continuing to strive along those, those lines. And here's the point. I can't say it often enough because for whatever reason there's folks out there that don't get it. They'll call me and they'll say, well, you know, I'm a taxpayer. you got to listen to me. Well, we do need to listen to you, but I tell you what, pay your taxes because it keeps you out of jail. It doesn't do much for the natural resources. What we need is a plan B. We need more contributions, and we are working with our legislative partners and with others to figure out how we might get that done at the same time that we truly appreciate hunters and trappers and everything they do now and have always done for the resource. Talk a little bit about the good news things that we got going on. These grouse enhanced management system areas are very cool. They are coming from all over the country to use our resources here. I think that's pretty cool for a couple of reasons. One, it, it speaks to the high quality of the grouse hunting in the Upper Peninsula. It also speaks to the fact that every out-of-state hunter is worth five times what a uh, resident hunter is. That's a good thing. I know it's kind of down and dirty to talk about money, but money does in fact make the world go around. And it's great to have people coming here and spending their dollars in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and those GEMS projects are a big piece of that. Uh, related to that, we have gone towards opportunity, sometimes at the expense of quality. And I think it's time that we start thinking about quality a little bit more, not exclusively, but to think about how we create truly high quality hunting experiences of all kinds, whether that's for deer or grouse or waterfowl or other species. We have the capacity to do that and serve everybody with the big box notion that multiple, you know, magnificent amount of opportunity that this state provides. But how do we segment out and create more high quality opportunities for hunting? Up here, it could be around deer in some places. How do we do that? Well, there are only a couple of ways you can think about. One, of course, is to limit participation. Another is to limit the length of a season. I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's reasonable and responsible to have those conversations, and, and so we're going to. Something that, uh, as well, continues to pose a threat to us is invasive species. You know, that's one of those things that you know, when you say invasive species, everybody thinks Asian carp, you know, and yeah, Asian carp are bad, but there are all kinds of other things that are important. But we have pigs running around on the landscape. You know, in southern Michigan, we have pretty well, as far as we can tell, eradicated wild pigs on the landscape there for a variety of reasons. But to replace those problems in the lower peninsula, we've got evidence of a growing problem here in the UP. And so this winter, Wildlife Services will be flying helicopter up here to try to understand just how many pigs we're talking about in certain areas along the Escanaba River and perhaps other locations. To try to understand the magnitude of the problem that we're trying to control. They are enormously prolific, they're enormously damaging, they can carry enough diseases to kill a blue whale and still be bright eyed and bushy tailed. It's a big deal for us. Uh, we're going to continue to move forward and do something around that. 
pretty quick here we'll have a as well a, a new estimate for our moose population. Along those lines you know there was the potential listing of moose in Michigan as in other parts of the Midwest. Whatever they're trying to list it's not the moose that we have here. We have a moose that was transplanted in from eastern Ontario. What they're talking about is something called the western moose. The only place in Michigan where there's this western moose is out on Isle Royal, which is another way of saying I don't want any of those moose coming on shore because when they do then we have the species that could consider, you know, be considered for listing and I, I think that's a bad idea. Um, we, by the way, are continuing to talk to the Park Service. They're going through NEPA now about what they're going to do about wolves on, on uh, Isle Royal. And our preference, which we have, I have stated to the uh, Park Service, is if they choose to do that, that they translocate mainland wolves from the Upper Peninsula out to Isle Royal, that they don't bring in wolves from some other place. Because we believe, our, our position is that we have an abundant population of wolves in the Upper Peninsula and just about every place they could be occupied as is occupied. We don't want wolves being brought into the state. We'd see that as an augmentation of the population. Now, it's up to the Park Service to figure out what they're going to do, but we've stated our opinions very clearly. Uh, last, just because it's topical, I guess I could talk about bear regulations. And you know, there's guys up here that don't want barrels, and there's guys in the lower peninsula that do want barrels, and there's guys up here that want concurrent openers, and I guess the guys down south do too. We'll be looking at that. This is a public process. The commission will start to hear our proposals uh, next month, the beginning of February. I expect that it'll be an interesting discussion. The parts that I care most about, frankly, is I don't want baiting to start any earlier than it does right now. We got enough stuff going on in the woods. And so I'm going to ask hunters to work with us on some of these things. If hunting is a good management tool, then hunters occasionally need to act like managers. And this just may be one of those things where guys will say, yeah, I always want more bears and so do I, but we have to manage conflicts at the same time and uh, move forward together to try to resolve some of these conflicts. Next week, we'll talk with Forestry Resource Division Chief Bill O'Neill. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Discovering.